Welcome, everybody, to episode 36 of the Rule Your Pool podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I'm your host, Eric Knight with Arenda, and um, I can't believe we've actually gotten to 36 episodes. This is great. I'm actually doing this one alone. Sorry to disappoint. I know everybody loves having Jared and Joe on here. They're the real stars of the show, but I couldn't get them in the interest of time. We got to get this stuff out. We're traveling again, and everything's picking up because as we wind down the season, Arenda's training season really picks up. So I'm trying to get stuff out so we can schedule it so that we have consistent podcast releases. And I don't know if you can hear that. L- listen carefully. Can you hear that? That's the sound of nothing. And that's a beautiful thing when you're recording something because I am in my new, air quotes, studio. And of course, by studio, I mean I'm sitting on the floor in my closet surrounded by clothes that do an outstanding job of muffling sound. Why? Because there's a road that goes by my place, and there are a lot of people out there that ride loud motorcycles, and people who pour money into their cars to make them louder, as if a muffler was never invented. It's the most wild thing, and I'm sick and tired of having to re-record things. I hope you can understand. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about evaporation and accumulation, because we are coming into the late season, and there's a lot of factors that get affected by how fast you lose water and how fast you have to replenish it, things like that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have an outdoor pool and you're in a very dry, arid climate, or if you're in a humid climate, it's going to be a little bit different for you, but everything is going to be covered in this episode, I hope. If not, comment in the links below reply to us, let us know, hey, you know, you didn't really describe my situation. Here's my question. We'd love to hear from you. So let's get into it. Episode 36. Go. Welcome to Rule Your Pool, the podcast by Arenda that explains and simplifies pool chemistry so that anybody, regardless of experience, can understand it. I'm your host, Eric Knight, bringing clarity to these subjects so that you can bring clarity to your water. If you're ready to rule your pool, then let's go. Let's start with evaporation. And I could talk for a while on this uh, because a lot of what I do personally is focus on indoor swimming pools and evaporation rates, relative humidity, dehumidification loads. All of that is very important to indoor air quality. But we don't need to get into all that complexity, especially with an outdoor pool. What you need to know is the basics. Evaporation, of course, is the process in which liquid water converts into Water vapor becomes a gas, and this process takes energy, and it's called evaporative cooling. It takes heat from the body of water and converts that. This is why you lose some temperature. So when, you know, if you're heating your pool and you're saying, oh, you know, I'm I'm losing heat, well, that's because evaporation is, that process is taking heat out of your pool, and you have to replenish that heat with your heater. Um, But I don't want to go down that tangent. I'm like at the top of the hill looking at it. I'm like, hmm, I could go down this tangent, but I'm not going to do it. Not going to do it, audience. We're good because that, that, that would take us into indoor swimming pools and dehumidification and a whole nother conversation. What you need to know is that the amount of humidity in the air is going to affect the evaporation rate. And there are other things too, like wind speed, if air is flowing across a pool, that will accelerate evaporation. And between humidity in the air and the difference between the water temperature and the air temperature... That temperature delta and the humidity in the air are the two biggest factors that affect evaporation. So let's let's make up a scenario here just for example. We're going to use Phoenix and Miami, Florida. Let's just say for a year in this fictional example, these two cities have an identical pool in them. Everything about these pools are identical. They have the same equipment, same flow rate, same everything. And in this fictional example, Miami, Florida has the exact same temperature as Phoenix every single day of a year. Of course, this wouldn't really happen, but, you know, it's make-believe. Let's go with it. Which pool is going to evaporate more? Or are they going to evaporate the same? The answer would be Phoenix. The pool in Phoenix is going to evaporate probably substantially more than the pool in Miami, and it has to do with the humidity in the air. Miami's a very humid place. There's a lot of moisture already in the air. Phoenix doesn't have a lot of moisture. It's a very dry heat, so it can hold a lot more. And uh, if you want to look further into that, feel free, do your own research. It's 
not hard to find. There's actually plenty of resources online available to you. But let's talk about how it affects pool chemistry, because that's really what we're here about. We're trying to rule your pool, right? We're trying to help, I should say, we're trying to help you rule your pool. It's not our pool. What happens when you lose water? And how much water are you really losing? Well, let's start with the latter. That's an easier question. An average pool is going to lose roughly its entire volume of pool water in a given year. Now, that's for a year-round climate. And I'm going to repeat that. An average pool in a year-round open climate like Southern California or some place that they don't winterize the pool, you are going to lose roughly the entire volume of your pool in a season, in a year. Isn't that crazy? You might think, well, maybe an indoor pool wouldn't be as much. Actually, a properly dehumidified pool with the correct you know, 55% relative humidity and the proper moisture removals and the proper air temperature controls is going to be almost exactly the volume of the pool in evaporation in a given year. It's pretty wild to think about. Now, the shape and the surface area of your pool actually do affect this. So if you have like a small but very deep pool, well, the surface area actually matters more than the depth. So you're, you're probably not going to evaporate the entire volume of your pool. But if you have a big, wide, sprawling pool that's very shallow, yeah, you probably will. You might actually evaporate more. And, you know, again, the difference in temperature between the water and the air makes a huge difference. And you might think, oh, well, a very cold pool in a very hot climate like, uh, you know, Phoenix is, is going to evaporate more because the hot air would, would draw more evaporation. Eh. It's actually the opposite. Um, the hotter the water compared to the air, so like let's say you had 80 degree water and the temperature drops to 75 degrees or even 60 degrees or something like that for who knows what reason, you're going to lose a lot more water. Maybe you're heating your pool and it's November. You're actually losing a lot more heat, not because it's cold outside, but because the water's warm compared to the cold outside. So it's that temperature delta that's really driving that. So regardless of how fast you're actually losing it and how much you're actually losing it, let's talk about how it affects the chemistry. When water evaporates, it only takes pure water out of the pool. That means everything else is left behind. H2O is what leaves. But think about all the other stuff. You got your total dissolved solids, all the minerals, all the metals, all the used up nitrates, cyanuric acid, all of these things are left behind. And depending on how you got them into the pool in the first place, they can begin to accumulate. Now I'm going to give you two examples of things that might accumulate. Calcium hardness. If you are losing water, you have to replenish with the hose. Hose water usually has calcium hardness in it. It may not be a lot, but there's some. And that extra calcium is going to go up. Now, I will say um, that's usually a wash. You don't typically see that uh, because if people are using the pool, there's splash out. You know, you're actually losing some water too. Or if your pool has a leak, of course, your, your numbers will go down. But Or they could go down, I should say. Um, usually your calcium is going to stay pretty consistent because it's, it's not a lot, unless you have a lot of calcium hardness in your tap. And a lot of people do. Maybe they've got very hard water. Okay, yeah, your calcium hardness is going to creep up and up and up and up the more you go, and you're going to see it a lot faster at the rate of refill. Um, another example of this could be metals. Metals are also in tap water usually, especially if you're on a well. Those metals can go up and up and up. So um, those sort of things, anything that comes from the tap is going to lead to more accumulation. But there's other things that just simply get diluted, like salt. Hopefully there's no salt in your tap water. Now, you might have to replenish your salt if you have a salt water pool because of dilution, because of evaporation. You lost it, and now you have to you know, replace that water with tap water that does not have salt. So your salinity goes down. So you have to add it. Same thing with cyanuric acid. Cyanuric acid stays behind. But it doesn't accumulate unless you're using something like trichlor or adding cyanuric acid products because it's not in your tap water. At least it better not be. So think about what could be coming in from your tap water, and those things are the things that tend to accumulate. Everything else tends to actually be reduced or stay the same. It's usually like kind of a, a net zero, so to speak. Now, most backyard pools 
don't really notice a big difference in dilution with these things because they're only losing, you know, half inch to an inch, maybe an inch and a half of water in a given week or two weeks in the heat of summer. But most of the season, they're not losing at that rate. So you don't really notice these things. But over time, over multiple seasons, these numbers definitely change. Now, with calcium, it just as an aside, not because of accumulation in the regard we're talking about, if chemistry is unbalanced, it can be pulled out of the like a plaster type surface, which we've done plenty of episodes on that already. That can accumulate too, but that's a different issue. I do want to direct your attention to a article that we've written. And if you just go to blog.orendatech.com, or if you go into the Orenda app and you go to articles, just type in the word evaporation, you're going to find it. And uh, there's a little graphic in there that shows um, metals and calcium would come from your, from your fill water, and then chemicals like cyanuric acid, salt, also metals, because some chemicals do contain metals, calcium, like if you're using Cal Hypo, all these things can affect accumulation rates. So if you have levels that seem out of whack, maybe you should think about your evaporation. And I'm going to give you an example. In fact, it's the example of why I chose this episode instead of the other 20 or so episodes that we have written down in the queue of what people have requested us to cover. I was talking to a customer who is really struggling with a calcium line, a scale line on their tile. And it's like perfectly a, a half inch to an inch above the water line every time they see it. I'm like, hmm, okay, so there's no scale below the, below the tile and it's all above. And the water's not quite touching it or when people are in, it might touch it, whatever. Well, that's usually an evaporation line. And it might have some calcium in it. It's not necessarily an LSI violation. It's annoying, I get that. And it could very well be calcium carbonate, but did you necessarily have an LSI violation to get that evaporation line? No, not necessarily. I mean, if you did have one, it would absolutely make it worse. It would accelerate it. But think about it this way. The LSI is measuring the saturation equilibrium of your water. If you are losing water, especially at that site, water dries up, all the minerals are left behind. So that saturation goes through the roof. Therefore, it creates a localized LSI violation on the tile above the water line. We actually see this quite a bit. Now, you can minimize this if you're using SC-1000 or you're using any sequestering agent in the market. That will absolutely minimize that. But the evaporation line is somewhat unavoidable in some markets because the rate of evaporation is substantial. It certainly can be in Phoenix or Palm Springs or you know wherever you are in a hot, dry climate. You don't see this problem in New Jersey very often. If you do, it's actually probably scale, and it's not above the tile line so much as it is at it or below within the water. Now let's flip it to the other side of the coin. What about dilution? Now we already covered that you can have metals and minerals in your tap water, and those things will accumulate. You know, you move, you lose pure water and you replenish it with mineralized water. Okay, you know, all of our hose water has minerals in it for the most part, and that stuff is going to accumulate. Got it, no problem. But what if the dilution source is not the hose? What if it's the rain? Well, you're back to zero. You're back to square one, right? Because the rain is pure water. I mean, it's distilled water by definition. So it is exactly the same water that left. Now, if you have an overflow, like a, as most pools should, if you have an emergency overflow so your pool doesn't flood, you're actually going to lose water and the minerals are going to go with it. You could actually dilute down your cyanuric acid and your calcium hardness and other things and your TDS, salinity, all that stuff right out the drain. So if you have a lot of rain, your numbers tend to go down because there's nothing in the rain and because of the loss of water. That's why that happened. There is, of course, an exception to this, and that is during winterization. Uh, most people, when they winterize pools, they're going to drain that pool down, you know, 18 inches or so, or maybe just below the tile line, depending on where you are, depending on the type of pool you have, of course. And uh, they'll blow out the lines, etc. And they're going to prepare you for freezing temperatures. And now you've got a pool with a lot less volume in it. So the numbers, actually, the, the chemistry when it was full should be identical to the chemistry of this two-thirds full pool, right? Because you actually just discarded the water. You didn't really 
it didn't evaporate out is what I'm saying. It didn't leave everything behind. You actually took the water whole cloth. You took it all, you took it all out. Um, if you have a mesh cover or no cover, rain and snow are going to get into that pool and they are actually going to dilute those numbers substantially. If you have a solid cover, you won't have this issue, but mainly because the rain and snow are not getting in, or at least for the most part. Maybe it gets in under the sides or something. But uh, if you have a mesh cover, rain and snow are going to dilute those numbers. And this is why we advocated Arenda that you need enough calcium in your pool to get through the winter in its coldest conditions. You need to have an LSI that is balanced at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. You know, for our friends up in the Great White North who use the metric system, eh? But the point is, if you don't have enough then you can have a low LSI violation. And there is a direct correlation between this happening and opening up your pool in the spring with damage to the pool. Calcium issues, primarily calcium crystals and winter dust. If you're unfamiliar with um, our research on this, you can, again, go to blog.orendatech and just type in crystal, crystals, winter, cold, cold water. You know, we got a search bar. It's a beautiful thing. You can find this stuff. And... It's very common. It's a very common problem. The thing is, if you have a mesh cover, uh, you don't know what your dilution is going to need to be. You don't know if you're going to have another snow apocalypse like there was in 2009 and 2015. You just don't know. How much rain are you going to get? Why not prepare for it? Why not have enough calcium in reserve that no matter what gets thrown at you, you can adapt. You'll have enough calcium because it's cold water. I mean, you're not going to scale that pool in really cold water. Rely on calcium. It is your best friend. Add it yourself so that it doesn't have to come out of the walls. So one way to think about this is an analogy. I'm going to use a glass of water. I got a glass of water. Let's say the calcium hardness in that glass of water is 200 parts per million. Now, if I drink half of that glass, what is the parts per million of calcium left in the glass with half the water? It would still be 200 because I drank whole water. I took everything with it, right? When I drank half that glass. So all the minerals, all that stuff in there are gone. So that would be an analogy like splash out or an overflow or leaking or something like that, where you're actually losing entire whole water. Now, conversely, if I had that glass and I just let it evaporate for a month or so down to halfway, or maybe I heated it up and accelerated that process and get it down to halfway, what's the parts per million of the bottom of the glass now. Well, that half of water is now 400 parts per million. It doubled because the calcium and everything else stayed behind. Only pure water evaporated. So keep that analogy in mind when you're thinking about what could possibly be accumulating. And if it's going up without you adding things, it's probably coming from your tap water. And if it's not in your tap water, then it's got to be in a product that you're introducing, or in the case of calcium, it could be coming out of your walls. So just be thinking about where these things could originate. I think that's pretty much it. Um, this has been episode 36 of the Rule Your Pool podcast. I'm your host, Eric Knight with Arenda. It has been a pleasure. I really enjoy doing this, and I love hearing from you when you contact us and say, oh, yeah, I heard the podcast and it answered a question. It, it just warms my heart. So thank you for that. We hope that we continue to produce valuable content. So if you have any episodes that you want us to cover, any discussions, any topics, any big questions you have, please email us, info at Arendatech. Uh, drop us a line on Facebook, like our page. It's Arenda Technologies. Um, we're everywhere. I mean, it's, it's not hard to get a hold of us, but we do hope to hear from you. And if you know somebody who you think could have value from this podcast, please share it with them. Ask them to subscribe. It really helps us out. And, uh, I think that's all the self-promotion that my heart can handle at the moment. So take care, everyone. I don't know what we're going to cover next, but that's par for the course. Take it easy. Thank you for listening to Rule Your Pool, a podcast by Arenda Technologies. For more information on what we discussed in this week's episode, check the links in the description or visit www.arendatech.com. I hope you find this show valuable enough that you tap that subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can also like us on Facebook and social media. And with our help, you'll be able to rule your pool without over-treating it with chemicals and wasting money. I'll see you next episode.